Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So, Stoke on Trent Central has been voting today in the by election after Tristram Hunt left to run the Victoria and Albert Museum. And the polls have now closed here, so our panel is free to say exactly what they like about politics tonight. And we have on the panel the Education Secretary, Conservative MP for Putney since 2005, Justin Greening, her Labour shadow, and a woman talked about as a possible successor to Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the party, Angela Rayner. UKIP's sole MP who defected from the Conservatives in 2014, Douglas Carswell, the chairman of Stoke City Football Club and the owner of the online bookmaker Bet365, Peter Coates, and the journalist and co-author of a controversial biography of David Cameron, Isabel Oakeshott. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. And remember, as always, you can join in this debate. Facebook, Twitter, text us on 83981. Our first question comes from Aidan Straker, please. Does the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn still represent the working class and communities such as Stoke? Justin Greening, does the Labour Party still represent the working class and communities such as Stoke? Well, Stoke's been a safe Labour seat ever since it was created, which is decades ago. And I think the answer to your question is, no, I don't think it does. I think there was a time when Labour did have something to say to working people in our country, but I think that time has passed. And it'll be interesting to see what the results are in Stoke later tonight. But the fact that we're even talking about the fact that Labour might lose this seat tells you everything about the predicament that the Labour Party is now in. And that's because they're not representing working people around our country and I think it's the Conservative Party and Theresa May as Prime Minister that's actually setting about making sure that we've got a low tax economy with jobs for people and careers for people and somebody who's standing up for us as we leave the EU and getting a good deal for Britain when we finally okay. make our way in the world. The polls closed um, 50 minutes ago. Have you had any indication of what's happened? I think we'll all have to wait and see. No, and, and actually, we'll, if, there's one, if there's one thing we've learnt, it's probably not to rely on the polls right. when people go out to vote no, at the but, moment. But, You've got to rely on the polls of well, the voter in, who as votes. In the, as in the opinion polls, as in you're the opinion polls. You've got to trust the voter. Uh, just, I, I'll come to you in a moment, but have you got any indication how it's gone tonight? Do you think you've won here? Well, I don't take anything for granted, David, ever, in I any of the I, elections. Do you think you've won? Well, we'll have to see, because I, I don't know. I've not been uh, right. at the ballot box today. Well, my information is that it looks as though Labour's taken the seat. Peter Coates. Well, I, I think Labour has made the mistake of... of it does represent working people. I don't accept that the Tories represent working people and Labour doesn't. <laughs> it's never been like that in my lifetime, and I don't believe it is today. Uh, but they do see an opportunity because the Labour Party's in a bit of a mess, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn as uh, a leader, as obviously not connected with the great British public. I think the majority of people don't see him as a future Prime Minister. And uh, it's got its work cut out. And as with Scotland, Scotland was taken for granted in the same way, I think, and they lost it to the Scottish Nationalists. And I hope it's a wake-up call for Labour to realise that they have got to make sure they represent uh, places like Stoke, and there are many places like Stoke around the country, uh, and get their act together and... What we need is a leader who can connect with the great British public, uh, got a chance of winning, and of course you need policies. You, you, Peter, what, you, you what have is, to have what credible is it, economic policies. What, what is it you think that goes wrong between a, if you say the party doesn't represent properly places like Stoke? What is it that goes wrong with a political party? Is it that it gets complacent because it's always re-elected and re-elected? Uh, I think there's a lot of that. I think complacency plays, plays a part. You get taken for granted. You, you, you get taken for granted. And uh, I think Scotland got taken, taken for granted and uh, Labour got wiped out. And, uh, and they're in danger unless they don't get their act together and realise 
their priority is to make sure that working class people are properly represented and considered and a part of the whole of this country uh, they will suffer but I think I think there's a big realization now within the party that this, this has got to be done okay you say on the second row there I uh, can I ask the panel if they say Labour no longer represents the working class who does represent the working class there? Well, well let's search for that Douglas Carswell well, I, I don't think the Labour Party does represent the traditional uh, working class vote that it used to represent. It's no longer the party of Keir Hardy. And the fact that if Labour holds the seat, and I think it's most likely that Labour will hold the seat, the fact that that is somehow regarded as a triumph tells you quite how dire the crisis on the centre-left is in British politics. I think there's a fundamental problem with the Labour Party, and it goes, it goes far beyond the shortcomings of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. The Labour Party used to represent, as the name implies, the sectional interest of organised labour. Um, for many generations now, it's represented a sectional interest of career politicians in London. And there's a fundamental disconnect now between the Labour Parliamentary Party and traditional Labour votes. And I think there's a race on to see who can take their place. The Labour Party once displaced the Liberal, Demo uh, the, the Liberal Party. Uh, the Liberal Party once used to hold sway in vast swathes of the country and Labour was the insurgent party. I think we could see a new insurgent party if an insurgent party gets its act together that could displace the Labour Party. I think there's a huge market opportunity for a different kind of party. OK. And um, uh, just before we go on, um, UKIP had its new leader, Paul Nuttall, standing here. You seem to have conceded that he hasn't won Stoke contract. I, I, I think the most likely outcome is that Labour will win. Let me explain why. Stoke is not even in our top 50 target seats. Um, it's been a Labour voting constituency since 1950. If we were to win, turn that round, if we were to win, it would be, it, it would be such a, a, an earthquake, it would be akin to the great Spen Valley by-election of 1919, which marked the demise of the old Liberal Party. But look, you know, I, I know a little bit about by-elections having fought one. We, we fought and got quite a good swing to, to my new party in, in Clacton. And I, I think in terms of the mechanics of the campaign, Paul and UKIP have actually fought a very good campaign in terms of the organisational structure, in terms of... Um, we, we haven't had the, uh, the South Thanet mayhem that, that, that we uh, have had in previous contests. You've had the Hillsborough mayhem, on the other hand, haven't you? <laughs> David, can I just... Uh, hang on a second, I'll come to you. The man with his hand up there. Yes, um, if Paul doesn't win the seat tonight, can we expect his new house in Stoke to be back on the market tomorrow? <laughs> Hardly been lived in. Angela Rayner. OK. Um, I recognise people's frustration with the Labour Party. I was elected in May 2015, and I'm probably one of the only people on the panel here that had a manual job that was a home carer before coming into Parliament. And I come from the trade union ring and not one where I was, uh, elect I was elected rather than appointed into it. So I feel that frustration. I'm what some people consider to be a safe Labour seat. I've never see my seat as safe Labour and nor should we and Scotland is a wake-up call to ensure that we do that but people feel left behind and frustrated by successive governments that have not rebalanced our economy because if you know Labour did a lot of great things we built schools we put we invest in our national health service but the infrastructure and the economies around our areas we still feel like we're on our knees and they're not supporting and not supplying the economies and the help to the businesses that are required in their midlands in the northwest and northeast and in those areas that quite frankly feel left behind after the deindustrialization of the UK. Um, uh, <laughs> so when, when Mr Corbyn says it's the problems with the media that is doing him down, you don't agree with that entirely? You think there well, are other problems? I think we've always had problems with the media. You can't blame everything on the media, but we've got to listen to the Don voters Donald and Trump we've got to do does. something about Donald them. Trump does. You can follow in his example. All right. Uh, you sat there on the gangway there, and no, then I, I think, come to you as well. I think the problem with the country at the moment is, is you've stopped, we've stopped making things and we've become a giant warehouse, and we need to start producing again. And the people will vote for people who are getting us back on our feet and producing and making more things. And uh, is the sound that comes out of Labour not one that resonates with you then, because of that? Not at all, nobody. There's nobody no, does? nobody at the moment, no. Isabel Oakeshott. Well, look, I think that whatever the result tonight, Jeremy Corbyn should go. I think that basically... 
nobody, literally nobody except possibly Angela Rayner, looks at Jeremy Corbyn and thinks he's going to be Prime Minister. I think that the current Labour leadership is deluded, it's discredited and it's doomed. And frankly, it's doing a great disservice to those of us that want to see a robust opposition to the Tory government. OK. Uh, you sit up there. Um, yes, I you sit. I disagree. I think uh, Jeremy Corbyn is a wonderful leader. If he is given the chance, I think he doesn't lie. He's, he's not a... He's a very honest man, he's a very sincere man, and he does not stretch the truth like UKIP does. And, her, and sorry, who is not giving him the chance? His uh, own party? The media, or? for a start. Yeah. Uh, what about his own party his and own his party shadow cabinet who all resigned? A Stock on Trent is a uh, Labour party, uh, Labour supported area, and surely Angela and people like her should support, stand behind their leader. All right, Peter Coates, I'll come to you with the woman there first in the, in the third row from the back. Yes. Um, I struggle to understand what people want from a leader. I think Jeremy Corbyn has got integrity, he's honest. When I've been to Stoke to the rallies he's um, spoken at, he's got great support. And uh, I want an honest leader. I don't want somebody who is all singing, all dancing, but tells lies or um, is disingenuous. I want somebody who is honest and with integrity, and I think Jeremy Corbyn has got that. Okay. <laughs> I come to you now. Peter Coates. I, I, first of all, I wanted to pick up on uh, the, the uh, comment the gentleman made about manufacturing. And Stoke uh, has uh, retained manufacturing at something like it's 13.5% uh, of the output of this city. It's the highest manufacturing uh, contribution of any city in the UK. Uh, so we've done rather well, comparatively. Uh, and I'm afraid that we, we also have to realise these manufacturing jobs, by and large, are not coming back. But the ceramic industry has got itself together and is doing well and is growing, taking on more jobs. So don't despair in that sense that, uh, you know, the city, the city has done, from a manufacturing point of view, uh, very well. Uh, uh, OK, you serve the spectacles there. Yeah, I don't think it matters who Labour have as the leader. I think they're just going to get wiped out at the next election anyway, so... <laughs> why do you I think, think that? <clears throat> well, they're 18 points behind in the polls. Um, a lot of working-class people have gone over to UKIP, like myself. I've voted Labour all my life, and I've never voted for them again, because I don't think they represent my uh, view of the world anymore. Did you vote today? Yes. How did you vote? I voted for UKIP. You voted for UKIP. Yeah. Let's, let's, all right, fine. Let's go on and talk a bit about UKIP. Um, Stephen Heath, let's have your question. Just before we go on, uh, I should briefly say Bedford next week, if you're listening in Bedford tonight. Sunderland the week after, if you're listening there. That's what question time is going to be. The details are on the screen. I'll give them at the end. But Stephen Heath, can we have your question? Is defeat for UKIP in the, British, in the Brexit capital by-election today the end of the party? Yeah, the Brexit capital was what Paul Nuttall called Stoke uh, because it was um, in the top group of uh, parts of the country that voted for Brexit. So if they're defeated here, is it the end of the party? Uh, Angela Rayner. Well, I think UKIP are a busted flush. They were a one-issue uh, one party. Uh, both of the main political parties have said they respect the will of the people. Trig they've triggered Article 50. We are going to look at the best deal possible we can get out of that. UKIP haven't got um, a strategy on how to be in government and actually can't even tell the truth. Their leader has told so many lies, he makes Donald Trump look honest. So I think the thing... Douglas Carswell? We were always the underdogs in this con contest. We were always uh, up against a party that has been uh, elected in Stoke since, um, since the middle of the, the last century. But, you know, I, I think that... Although we uh, fought a, a good campaign in terms of the mechanics of the campaign, uh, I, I do accept that you know, we, we have a problem, and that was evident in this contest as it's been evident in other election contests, and that is that we, we are not given the benefit of the doubt. And I think the benefit of the doubt in politics is absolutely worth its weight in gold. In, in any by-election, in any election whatsoever, you will get things thrown at you. People will look at old blog posts and 
what you wrote on Twitter some years ago. I understand the Labour Party had a, a, a few issues with that. If, if people give you the benefit of the doubt, you can get through that. Um, we, as a party, need to ask ourselves, what is it? What is it to do with our values? What is it about us that mean many people aren't giving us the benefit of the doubt? And that's a key question, regardless of the outcome of the by-election, I think we need to ask ourselves on Friday morning. Um, if we're to be credible, we need to understand why it is people have not given us the benefit of the doubt. I personally think a lot of it is to do with the legacy issues of the, the shock and awful tactics that we adopted so unsuccessfully in the run-up to the last general election. And I think we need to recognise that there are issues to do with that that need to be addressed for us to win seats. And, and, and how, how, sorry a second, just, but how, how can you carry on as a party when Nigel Farage, who's seen as, apart from you, as the main UKIP candidate, says that you shouldn't be in the party, doesn't think you st believe in what we stand for? No, I mean, do you... St well, I, I think Farage that, and you I, seem to be completely at odds over well, what UKIP is. He seems to represent UKIP. You're the leader of UKIP in the House of Commons. Well, I think he seems to be, he seems to be representing um, um, UKIP or LBC in, in, um, in, in, in Washington at the moment. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to have a dig at, at, at Nigel. I think oh, he's done great did, things. you just did, Douglas. You just I, did. I, I think he's done... I, <laughs> I, I think he's done some, some, some great things. I think it's because of him that UKIP became the force that it, it's been. But I, I, I think now Paul has to take us to the next level, well, and I think he's begun to do that. Douglas, you're banging on about giving the benefit of the doubt. Unless you know something that the rest of us don't, you're not even giving your own party the benefit of the doubt. You're sounding as if it's a definite defeat for UKIP tonight. We don't know that. <laughs> and secondly... As I was making my way up here tonight, I had a very interesting tip-off, and since we're here, I thought I would ask you directly about it. Um, David has mentioned, you know, the feud between yourself and Nigel Farage, which you yourself brought up. Uh, I understand that Nigel Farage should have got a knighthood. I personally believe he w deserved to get a knighthood. And he was... He was certainly put forward for a knighthood and it appeared that everything was going swimmingly until you were asked to give your endorsement to that and you failed to do so. Is that true? That's simply not the case. I'm afraid... Well, that is certainly I, what I, I've I would love it if I had the power to give knighthoods. I would award lots of people knighthoods. I didn't say that. I said you were asked to give your backing to it. I, 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 I absolutely... So you were never asked to give your backing or give any comment or feedback on it? Absolutely not at all. Uh, is it in your power to give knighthoods to Nigel Farage? I wish it were. W would you give him one if I've you were? I've often called him sir. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, so that, uh, that uh, I don't know what we make of that. Justin Greening. I think it does increasingly seem like UKIP really was a, a one-man party at the end of the day. And I think before we had the referendum... A Carswell party or a Farage well, they, party? Well, it's got through a few leaders, so it may be that Douglas, Douglas can do it next, but... I just think before the referendum last year, I mean, clearly UKIP was campaigning for us to come out of Europe. And it seems to me that I think the part of the problem is people don't really know what UKIP stands for now and also the characters involved. And, and you know, the question about Paul Nuttall putting his house on the market perhaps tomorrow morning. I think there's just a sense of people don't know, didn't know what Paul Nuttall stood for and also didn't really have a sense as to... Who was going to benefit from Paul Nuttall getting elected? Was it going to be people in Stoke who needed a local MP to represent their community? Or was it going to be Paul Nuttall who wanted more profile for Paul Nuttall? And I think it, it seemed to everyone like it was the latter. Yes, um, Douglas just made a point about uh, UKIP, um, like having a good campaign this time around, but I think one of the fundamentals, fundamentally things that uh, Paul Nuttall got wrong is if he's going to apply to be a Member of Parliament for Stoke, one of the first things he should know that this city's got six towns and be able to name every one of them six, <laughs> uh, six towns, in my opinion, anyway. Once he got that wrong, all his credibility was gone. All right, and, and, and you? It's just not true that UKIP didn't see this as a target. They threw everything at this election, including hiring an expensive shop in the middle of Hanley. What you haven't had is the benefit of your lies, you haven't been given the benefit of your division, and you haven't been given the benefit of the hate. And that's what the people have voted against you, and that's why you're going to be rejected. Peter, yes. I, I'd like to come in, because there we're, we're talking about the present uh, uh, UKIP leader, Paul Nuttall, and uh, you've heard me criticise Jeremy Corbyn tonight. Well, he, he seems a paragon of virtue to me, 
compared with Paul Nuttall. And if that's the best UKIP can do, <laughs> if that's the best they can do, they're in a mess. They've only got, they're, they're a party of anti-immigration and out of Europe. Uh, and they're trying to come in and, and, and take this uh, working class vote, as they're talking about. And there's nothing I've heard come from Paul, uh, not all, that would suggest he's any, got any interest in, in the values of working class people. He, the, the most important thing for working class people is the National Health Service. And he's talked about uh, he, he, he would like to do away with it and privatise it. And as for mm. Nigel Farage, well, he, he's damaged the country beyond measure for me because, because, <laughs> coming. <laughs> so, don't be misled about Europe. We've seen nothing yet. And I think this is going to play out very badly for Great Britain. And All right, well, we'll come, we may come to that in a moment. But the woman up there on the, on the gangway. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have to agree with that point, Peter. Unfortunately, I think you're actually speaking for a minority in Stoke-on-Trent. Mm. We had the highest percentage that voted to leave the EU. And with respect, I think the downfall of UKIP is down to the fact that Nigel Farage is no longer their leader. It, it, right. it doesn't just, mean you're right. No. It doesn't mean you're right. Um, um, just, just a word, uh, Douglas, before we go on. Uh, with Brexit means Brexit, says the Prime Minister, uh, and keeps saying it. Uh, that's what UKIP wants. What is them, for them to do if that's what the Conservative Party is doing? Well, I think politics is a cartel. Politics is run by a two-and-a-half-party system in Westminster. We've got them to do the right thing by Brexit, by UKIP by UKIP's efforts forcing the referendum and winning the referendum. But there are all sorts of other things that I think we need to change. Politics is a cartel, and until that cartel is broken, we're never going to get the politicians to represent us properly. Think things around Brexit, or are you talking about quite different things? Talk about monetary policy. Monetary policy right, okay. for the past generation has favoured big banks in London rather than manufacturing in towns like Stoke. We need a monetary policy run in the interest of the whole country, not the small banking oligarchy in London. Okay, you said there in the check chat. Uh, do you feel that the Brexit and Trump phenomenons that are happening across the world are correlated to racism or any of that stuff? What, what do you think? Or more? Um, I think it's because everyone is completely disillusioned with the political class in the United Kingdom. Uh, 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 right. Angela, just pick up, pick up his point, if you would. Yeah, I think, I think people are completely disillusioned and fed up with um, politicians and the political class who they, think, who they believe have not been representing them or speaking on their behalf. And I think, and actually, it wasn't UKIP that delivered um, Brexit, it was the people. It was the will of the people, and it will be carried out by all of the MPs that are in Parliament, otherwise at their peril, if they don't listen to the will of the people, because that's our democracy and we respect our democracy. What we've got to do now is move on from that and start talking about, well, OK, people were blaming Europe as why we wasn't having the jobs here, that immigration was the issue. Well, actually, now they're not the issues. Get on and start building and building our industries around it and giving our young people jobs and opportunities. That's what people Okay. You're at the, at the very back there. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not surprised the disillusion because in an area that voted 70% um, to leave, Labour put up a candidate that's a massive remainer. But he has been absolutely clear right the way through his campaign, although he personally was a Remainer, that he respects the will of the people and that he would have voted to trigger Article 50. And Labour voted to trigger Article he's not, 50. He's not been shouting about it, though, has he? If he gets quizzed on it, he answers it. <coughs> but he hasn't been going out there mentioning that all, the, all along, unless you're really into it, like, unless you get to the bare bones of it. All right. I, I can only talk about what we've done and the record that we've had. And we've been absolutely clear. Jeremy, as our leader, has been absolutely clear that we were a party of Remain, just like the Conservatives were, but we, the electorate voted out. So we're coming out of Europe. Okay. We triggered well, you, you, you mentioned disillusionment and that we don't agree. What's the point of putting a Remainer in an area that the people don't how, want how many, that? How many, we don't want that how many, Okay, how many members of the Labour Party in the House of Commons voted against Article 50? Well, there was a number. How many? There was a number. How of, many? There was a number of. One in five. 
There was a number. It was so a he's got a point, number, hasn't one he? in five. But, but you've got to understand, David, that their constituents. They voted for remaining overwhelming. It was just like the people here are saying in Stoke, they voted overwhelmingly to leave. So why would some, you choose some well, you MP who was a remaining MP? MP so why would you choose that? If, if the, the constituents here the, vote, they want to leave, why would you select a remain the supporting Labour candidate? Party members right. get to choose. But Gareth was clear in his hustings and has been clear throughout the whole of his candidacy that he respects the will of the people. All right, fine. Let's leave that. We'll see what happens if he's elected, which we think he has. We also actually hear that Copeland has been held by Labour. The Tories haven't taken Copeland. This is purely surmise at this moment. It's people at the count looking at people's faces, I suspect, and seeing whether they're disappointed mm -hmm. or not. The man next to the monitor there, just briefly, if you would, sir, and then I want to... I've just got two mm -hmm. brief points. Firstly, yes. um, to and, uh, Andrew Rayner's point um, about the fact that the MPs who voted to, against Trigger and Article 50 were, uh, for, were from constituencies which overwhelmingly backed to remain. Um, I don't remember Newcastle on Dime backing remain, and Paul Farrelly certainly backed uh, not Trigger and Article 50. Um, well, let's get back to the essence of the question. I think that I, I will say that I, I voted for UKIP in this by-election, but UKIP has fundamentally failed to, to do what it needs to do. It's, it's not been able to get rid of the image of uh, racism or unprofessionality which has dogged it for the last two years. And yet you voted for it, you say? I voted for it because... <laughs> I voted for it because I saw the other issues, which it wasn't campaigning enough, enough about. It's, it needs to stress the fact it wants to campaign, it, it's campaign against the massive white elephant supported by all major parties, which is HS2. £200 billion, pound, which could all right, go to... OK. So you had other reasons apart from the Brexit yes, but I think that... All right. Um, um, let's, let, let's just stick um, with this, albeit in a slightly different manner, with a question from Joan Fox, please. Has Tony Blair's intervention on Brexit helped or hindered the Remain cause? Let's. A word about Tony Blair's intervention, who said, we're going to be poorer once these Brexit negotiations are complete. The country is going to be poorer, and everybody will say that leaving is inevitable, but it isn't. <coughs> Angela Rayner, is he right? Well, we're triggering Article 50 and we're leaving Europe, that's clear, and that's what the politicians are saying, they're elected to represent their constituents. That's Do what, people have a right to change their mind, as Tony Blair said? Tony Blair has a right to his opinion, and there is a lot of people in this country that hold the same view as Tony Blair. You've got, you've got to respect that some people have that view, but let's be clear that we're going down... The, you know, we are leaving Europe, and now it's about what sort of economy we have and how we untangle some of the legislation around that, because we need to bring that back. We can't keep going on or having the same argument like Groundhog Day. Are we going out of Europe? Are we going out? Are we going out of Europe? I think people are fed up with people intervening, trying to rehash it. We don't want to go there again. Move on, get on with the real job of actually bringing jobs and the economy back to where we want okay, it. OK, well, let me just go back to what your former leader said. Um, as the terms become clear of Brexit, he said, uh, it, people are going to change their minds and our mission is to persuade them to do so. In other words, if things don't turn out well, Labour should be in a position to say, well, you don't have to go there. Parliament should be in a position to say this hasn't worked out as Douglas Carswell thought it might. Is that, is that a fair position? Well, you know, the last 18 months since I've been elected to Parliament have not been what I expected it to be, so I'm, I'm not for predicting at the moment, to be honest, because I'd have never predicted where we are today and that Trump would be doing what he's doing. But I can tell you, at the moment, there's no will of the people to rehash and have, have, have the argument again and again. We're coming out of Europe. I'm focused on getting the best deal for the people, working-class people of Britain, making sure that I do the stuff as a Labour politician that will make people of Stoke and the rest of the working-class people in this country. Proud okay, fine. Of the Labour Party. All right. All right. Uh, Douglas, I will of course come to you. But Justin Greeny, how did you vote on the on the uh, issue of Remain or Leave the EU? I supported the Brexit bill that went through Parliament. How did you vote uh, when on June the twenty third? And I, I was a Remainer, and indeed, exactly. in the so. same way that most people here in Stoke were for Leave, I had a opposite um, right. split of my so, community so for Remain. Come, come to Blair. If the negotiations don't go as 
You obviously hope they will, and the Prime Minister hopes they will. Brexit means Brexit. If it gets difficult, if it's not quite what was expected, if, there is, if, if Blair is right that the country is poorer, that there are fewer jobs as a result, do you think it should be the House of Commons business to say, OK, in that case, we've changed our mind, we won't quite do it like this? Well, or do you think it's game, set and match to leave? Well, first of all, the Prime Minister said we are going to get on with Brexit. To answer the question that was asked, I think anybody who is still campaigning for Remain has been massively hindered by Tony Blair getting involved. I think it's almost the kiss of death for them. And we've just talked about why people are so disillusioned with politics. And I think a lot of the roots of that disillusionment started when Tony Blair was Prime Minister. He said he wanted people to get out in the street who cared about Europe. Well, he totally ignored them when they did that in relation to the Iraq war. And he represents the elite kind of politician that was a complete turnoff for millions of people in this country. And I think he's totally discredited to now enter the discussion about where our future is after we leave the EU. And I think it's absolutely outrageous, frankly, that he's got the cheek to turn around to the British people and say to them that he doesn't accept the decision that we took in our referendum last year. All right. You were at the, the man at the very back. You were at the very back in, in the blue shirt on, yes. Uh, a large part of economic performance is down to public sentiment. And every time some high profile person comes on television and says, We're going to be poorer and Brexit's going to hurt us, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. If people believe that, it will hurt us. OK, Peter Coates, do you agree with that? Well, I, I believe it. Uh, I believe it's going to hurt us and damage us very much. And I think there's a big distinction between voting coming out. And, uh, on, and what the terms are. Uh, so I think Tony, I, I found it very difficult to disagree with anything he said, and he's every right to say it. And uh, this is going to, in my view, will cost us dearly, unless the, the caveat is I don't know what the terms are going to be. And if we come out and we stay, if, if we're able to stay in the single market, we'll be fine. If, if we come out, we'll be in deep trouble. And don't take much notice of the last six months or the next two years, for that matter. This is a long game, and we shall see this play out over two, three, five years' time. And we'll look back, we'll look back and say, why did we do that? Look, I, I started my own business in 1968, and I do not know what the European Union has stopped me doing. I hear all this talk about uh, 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 the, uh, it, it stopped me doing nothing. I've never felt I wasn't governed by Parliament. I've got MPs around me, and I believe they, they, they govern us. I've never felt governed other than by Westminster, our law courts. And I think there's a, we've built Europe into a bogeyman that it isn't, and time will tell. I just... I... <laughs> I have no idea how you can possibly be so negative at this stage when all the signs so far, which you're so quick to dismiss, are so positive. At the moment, the banks are all upgrading their forecasts. None of the predictions of doom that we had about terrible economic crashes the minute we voted to leave have materialised. Well, so how can you be so well, incredibly very easily, pessimistic? Very easily, because what you're talking about is so short term as to be irrelevant. Completely and utterly irrelevant. You've got to look at the longer, long, long, longer term. So and, through the and crystal our economy, balls, through let, your let me crystal tell you, balls, let me tell you something you about our economy. No, uh, I, Peter, I, I, Peter, I can't Peter. guarantee that I'm right. I mean, Peter, I've just got an opinion. Just hold on a second. Let, let Douglas Carswell have a say, and then you answer him. Yes, okay. Talking long term, about 20 years ago, Tony Blair, Ken Clark, and Michael Heseltine sat on a stage pretty much like this and warned us that if we didn't give up the pound and join the euro, the economy would suffer. We were told again and again and again that we couldn't afford not to be part of the euro. Thank goodness we didn't take their advice. Thank goodness we kept out of the euro. I suspect that in five or ten years' time, it'll be difficult to find people who said that they were actively campaigning to remain. Yeah. Now, I, I think Tony Blair... Why do you say that, though? Because you take one example of the euro and then deduce from that that... Uh... The because, same is true this time trying to organize, This is much bigger try, than the try, Euro. Trying, leaving, to, or, trying to organize the economic and social affairs of hundreds of millions of Europeans by grand design leads to catastrophe. And by insulating ourselves from the worst aspects of that, keeping out of the Euro, keeping out of Schengen, we have preserved 
uh, our strength in Europe policy is not joining in. Yeah. Well, but we, we can't, Pete, hang on, we, we, don't want to, we don't want to fight the, the June 23rd debate. On, on What's happening now is the, the, the negotiations are about to begin, mm -hmm. and the question is whether, if the, raise the Tony Blair point, if the negotiations begin to look as if they're not going well, is Parliament in a position to modify Britain's exit from the well, EU, I, in your view? I, I think it's incredibly unhelpful for Tony Blair to make this intervention because I want a new consensus on Europe. I want a deal that allows Angela, Justine and Paul Nuttall all to agree on a new consensus on Europe. This has been incredibly divisive. I don't want to go through the experience of the past year uh, and the referendum again. I want a new national consensus. And the idea that yesterday's man, the man responsible for Iraq, the man responsible for presiding over the enormous credit boom and bust, can now wade in and say, present this fantasy idea that somehow not leaving is an option is very, very unhelpful. Right. Well, let, let's, let's get back to the... Uh, I've got the number of hands up for Peter. You, you answer him and then we'll go to well, one or two members of the audience. Let's get back to the economy. Take the car industry, which is a success in this country. Why is it a success? It's a success because we've been bailed out by uh, foreign companies. Uh, all, all our, all our inve the investment in our car industry is from India, America, France, Germany, and, the, 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 and they've sorted the problems out. We, 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 they, they put proper investment in, long-term investment. Britain doesn't do long-term investment very well. We rely so heavily on international investment in this country, and it, we shall become less attractive. Uh, you may or may not, you don't have to agree, but w wait and see. But why, uh, why, why, why do you think, think, why do you think it's all going to go pear-shaped? Why? Well, well the, I think we shall I mean, find... The negotiations well, haven't well, even begun. Just, just, we, 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 we've got a trade deficit. Our trade deficit is, mm. is the highest for 70 years. Is that great? But the one thing I do agree <coughs> with... You know, highest in 70 years. But the thing that I agree with Peter on is it is about the terms now. It's not about whether we're coming out or not. It's about the terms. And we've got businesses and trading partners within Europe that we need to make sure we can't do it piecemeal, which is what the government seems to be doing at the moment with the car dealerships. It can't be done piecemeal. We've got to make sure that we support our small, medium and enterprises within, this, within Britain to make sure that they can All continue right. to trade with Europe. It's a really important matter. And, let, and let the reality hit, is, let, since, since the vote, we've had a range of companies announce huge investment in the UK, whether it's Google, whether it's Apple, some of the Nova Nordisk uh, investment more recently, there's been a huge amount of um, investment coming into the UK. Okay. It's not been affected by us Let's saying that, that we'll leave. Let me go to members of the audience. I come to the woman there on the gangway, then I come to you over there. Yes. Oh, well, given Tony Blair's track record, taking us to war on the flimsiest of, the, of evidence and dodgy dossiers, why should anybody take his advice? Most people's instinctive reaction to any advice Tony Blair gives is to do exactly the opposite. Sure. Okay. And you, sir. Yes? I agree with the lady who's just spoken. I think Tony Blair should now keep quiet, just tend his garden or allotment at home. I think his intervention recently um, was actually, as many commentators said, um, to harm to, uh, <coughs> Jeremy Corbyn. He was hoping that uh, by him making this intervention, he would uh, dent any uh, potential of uh, Labour gaining in the by-elections today. If the reports coming through are correct, it looks as though uh, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party has, in fact, uh, gained to uh, <coughs> gain the elections today. Or, or held, held, held them, we should them. say. And the man here in the blue tie. Thank you, sir. Um, yes. There are many things about uh, Tony Blair that I disagree with, but I respect his right to say what he thinks. Um, and I think the most <laughs> important thing that happened in the last few months was the Gina Miller case. I actually had a mini number plate made with Gina Miller's name on, attached it to the back of my car and drove it round for one day to celebrate the fact that Parliament was going to decide and not just Mrs May. I only left it on for one day because I thought I'd get my car keyed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're out there. It was Tony Blair's fault, the reason why people voted out of Europe. It was Tony Blair who agreed to open door policy mm. where he said there was only going to be 50,000 people coming into this country. Yeah. And a million people came in. Yeah. And it was, and too, much it it was too much change, too quickly, and that's why people turned to UK. That's, that's who's to blame. What do you make of David Davis saying in Tallinn that it's going to be years and years and years before we end 
immigration. Well, it will. It will Estonia. be. It will. It You're will not be. fussed by it that. It will be, but it's Tony Blair's fault, and he originally should have put a cap on it and right. slowly done it. OK. But there, there's another point here, actually, which is that having politicians or former politicians like Tony Blair talking about having a second referendum or some kind of veto really undermines our Prime Minister as she begins this process of negotiation. It is pulling the rug from under her, and I think it is deeply unpatriotic to do that. Okay. Where, was, where, was, where was Tony Blair? All right. Where was Tony Blair when... When Stoke on Trent was losing jobs, the potteries were closing. Where was Tony Blair down? He was too busy messing about in Europe instead of looking after okay. his own people. Right, we're going to, we're going to move on to another question. Um, Adienka Odebade. Just yes. Shouldn't the government um, be doing more to improve the education level in the country rather than just focusing on creating more grammar school that we know we create the uh, we create a gap in the north and south divide that we already have in education the grammar schools which um the government has announced is announced proposals i don't know where they've got we've got two we've got the education minister in the shadow here so we'll find out proposals to allow new grammar schools um is that still on the cards i have uh, there's a report that you're rather you're smiling as if you're not quite sure about this policy or you rather want to drop it. No, not at all. I was about to say, I, I think... You're keen we, on it. So we had a consultation that finished in December. Uh, we're now going through all the results of that and we'll be setting out the next steps um, in the spring. But we've been very clear that we do want to take away this ban that stops uh, grammar schools being created. They're very popular with parents. But as importantly, you talked about how we can make sure we lift up uh, young people and, and everybody comes out of schools with a, a great education. When you look at disadvantaged children who go to grammars, their progress is twice as fast in a grammar school as their better off peers. So grammars are part of how we close the gap, but it's by no means the whole of our approach on education. And in fact, a few weeks ago, I announced that Stoke was going to be one of our opportunity areas, which will mean that we work inside schools in Stoke to raise outcomes for, for children here, but we also work outside with local businesses, the local community, uh, getting mentoring <coughs> into schools, making sure that young people have work experience. And right. we're doing that in 12 places in the UK where we think we can really make a difference in improving opportunities. So your, your, answer, your answer to him is that you're not, you're, you're not just focusing on grammar schools, but you are still committed to the grammar schools, the expansion of grammar schools. That uh, is still your policy. Yes, and what we want to make sure is that every child can reach their potential, and that means having an education system that meets the very different needs of our very different children, and grammar's a part of that, and I think it's time that we understood that the school system has changed massively over the last 10 years in particular. It's now time to look at what the role grammar's can play and, and how we can make sure that's a positive role, role, not just for children who get into grammars, but other schools as well. Okay, the woman in the fourth row there. I think, and I agree that grammar schools are improving. I actually believe that the old education system of having the apartheid, <coughs> so having the three levels of schooling, is actually something that we should go back to. My mother went to a grammar school, which used to be Clayton Manor Grammar School, um, that was locally around here. And again, like um, we have had said, she worked twice as hard, she got her scholarship, and she went forward. I don't think grammar schools are about a north-south divide. I think they should be for everybody. And I can see that investment having a big impact on places like Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, Angela Reyna. Well, I have to disagree with that because I don't think grammar schools are the answer to the crisis that this government has created in our schools. I think it's a oh. life raft How for is certain this children. That's where it. The, the, crisis, the crisis in our schools is that 98% <clears throat> of schools are seeing significant funding cuts. Now, the government promised in their manifesto that per pupil funding would be protected. It hasn't. Pupil numbers are increasing, national insurance pressures, pensions pressures. We've got all of these other issues that are having an impact on our schools where they're looking at facing around an 8% cut. And the national funding formula is still a very unfair formula that is penalising our children. Where are you on grammar schools to drop the question was about? I don't think grammar schools do aid social mobility. The evidence is quite clear that it doesn't. It's quite categoric. There's not a scrap of evidence that that does 
does. The attainment gap is greater in Kent as opposed to in Hackney, where there's no such grammars in, in their area. You know, 2.6% of free school meals in grammars, whereas in all other schools it's 14.9%. The evidence is quite clear. Grammar schools is not the answer. All Qualified right. teachers and money in our state schools is. The woman up there. Is it not more of a conservative driven thing where you think putting money into certain schools for certain children, why aren't you funding across the board improvements to all schools and so we that are. everyone can do it? Well, the, the one-size-fits-all policy clearly hasn't worked. When Blair came in, he said, education, education, education. You said it's the failures of this government, but actually, where are we now? We are 15th in the international educational league tables. We are behind Vietnam. So really, the system that we've had and that we inherited from the Labour years hasn't worked. I Why not try it differently? Because if you look at the London challenge where Labour did invest all of that money and we've got a comprehensive state system, actually the attainment gap was narrowed, it was transformative. We wanted to bring that to the Midlands, we wanted to bring it to Birmingham and Manchester. You know what? The coalition government scrapped it and they've not protected funding to our schools and Michael Gove said they will be held account by the PEAS the results, the international lead tables, and you failed because you've gone down yeah. that lead the, table. The, the children, t the children, yeah. um, the, the, the children who, the children who actually took the tests in the latest PISA uh, standard tables were children educated under Labour, Angela. Yeah, quite. All you, right, you, you sir. Schools, do I read correctly that uh, the government is planning to uh, invest something approaching £10 billion in free schools over the next period of years to about 2021? And we, we read almost daily reports of the underfunding of general schools, staffing crisis, crises, buildings falling to pieces, and yet the government can find £10 billion for free schools. Is that justified? All right, hold on. I mean... um, let, me, let me bring in Douglas Carswell and Peter Coates, and we'll come back to you on that. I'm massively in favour of grammar schools and massively in favour of free schools. And I, I think any debate about either government's record has to acknowledge that in all three parties there have been some good reformers. Andrew Adonis, um, Michael Gove have given us the academy programme. And that, that has helped. That has improved things in the education system. And I really hope Justine builds on that cross-party achievement. But when it comes to free schools, the reason why I'm so strongly in favour of them is something that happened in my constituency as a new MP in 2005. A £16 million brand new school was opened by Tony Blair three days before the 2005 general election. £16 million it cost. It was closed three years later. The existing system doesn't allocate resources effectively. Imagine what you could do in terms of free schools with that sum of money in a town like Clacton. Towns like Clacton need free schools. They're not just the preserve of people in places like London. Did you want to come back on the point? There is evidence that certain free schools are being opened in areas which, which, which do not need them. And I, my view is that there should be equality, that that money should be spread right across the with, system with, with, to give every with, child a good school in the area where he lives. With respect, sir... With, 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 with respect, sir, shouldn't we, shouldn't we leave it to the parents of the children to decide if those free schools are needed? Because by definition, you can't open a free school unless there's a demand for it. Peter Coates. Well, I think grammar schools are irrelevant and uh, will do nothing to improve the sc schooling for our children. Uh, uh, Isabel talked about where we are in the league. Well, we've been in that position for God knows how long. And we've had reform, different governments bring in reform, reform, reform. What, what the educational system needs is a break from all these reforms. Finland started reform its educational system in the 70s and 80s. It's a top <coughs> of the league. It has one school system for all children. No private education, one school system. <laughs> That's that's, that's how you get equality of opportunity. Uh, this, uh, 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 and, 
and we are short of funds, we, we're short of teachers, and they say, they're talking about how wonderful everything is, uh, we, we, we can't fund the health service properly, we can't, uh, we can't fund aftercare service properly, <coughs> and uh, we're short of teachers and education. It's all great. Okay, you, sir, there. I will come to you, uh, Justin. Yeah. Me? Yep. Under the national funding formula, which obviously you propose to bring in, 9,000 schools face cuts. Peter Coates says that we don't do long-term investments in this country. Here's one for you. Invest in young people, invest in youth. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> And there's record investment going into our schools. We have had to create lots of more new school places because of a demographic bulge of children coming into primary and now moving into secondary. In fact, over the last parliament, we created 600,000 school places. Many of them were free schools, but not by any means entirely. We've got to do another 600,000 of free schools. And you, know, you raised a perfectly good point about were these places in extra school places where they were really needed. Well, the NEO report that came out uh, earlier this week said actually overwhelmingly they were, so that is good news. But as Douglas points out, actually under free schools we had local communities able to take their own decisions about getting a new school and that was really important. And then in terms of the outcomes, well Ofsted has just said that nine out of ten of our schools nearly now are good or outstanding. That's a huge rise from 2010. And when we inherited a, a school system that was seeing about a third of children <laughs> coming out not even able to do the basics on reading and writing, so we had to come a long way. But we are year by year improving our system. And we're going around the world, places like Shanghai and China, to bring back the very best kinds of teaching to make sure that our children can benefit. And we're finding the very best kind of teaching across England as well to make sure that our teachers know how to teach the best <coughs> that they possibly can and I'd our like, children can benefit from that. I'd just take, I'd just take, no, I want to take a, a two or three more points from the audience. The, the woman up there, yes. Okay. Uh, I currently attend a secondary school. I go to Clayton Hall Academy. And recently, I'm aware that the year below me are no longer doing work experience. We have this new GS, GCSE. All our teachers, everyone seems so panicked. Different schools are deciding what our, the pass rate is with the new system. I don't understand why you're focusing so much on opening new schools, such as grammar schools, when the actual schools that are really trying hard aren't receiving the fundings that we need to support for mental health services okay. and general information that we do not have. And, and you over here on the gangway? <laughs> you? Uh, last year, only 54% of 11-year-olds uh, reached the required level in Stoke. How can cuts, further cuts to the education system raise attainment? OK, and, and you over there, sir. Um, Douglas has mentioned the success of the academy system. Why have we recently scrapped that, and where's the money gone for that? I think it's about £500 million that we've recently right. lost to invest in the academy system. OK, well, there are a lot of questions and different answers. Um, I'm going to go, we've only got a few more minutes. I, I want to raise uh, just one can other I, can question. I just come, can I just come yeah, very briefly yeah, on, on Angela seconds. Rayner? Yes. Um, I just saw you nodding and smiling when Peter said that there shouldn't be any private schools. Is it your policy that you would abolish private schools? I think we should, we should be moving towards a comprehensive education so you'd system. Abolish private schools. You, can't, you know you can't abolish private schools. It's what against about, the, what against about the United States. You do not see like to. Listen, uh, I, I mean, what amazes me about what you said, Justin, is everything post-2010 that, that you claim credit for is your, what you've done immediately. Everything that's bad that's going on at the moment with the government, it's the legacy of the last Labour government. Yeah. You can't have it both ways. You promised to protect per-pupil funding. Which broken, we have done. You have broken that promise with the we electorate. Don't, don't all parties on education and the NHS say it wasn't us, it was them? I mean, the, the facts are... No, 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 the facts are. Let's have a question from... Uh, I, I want to just end. Abbas Ebrahami, please. Let's have your question. Yeah. Is it ever right to compensate terror suspects? This is the case of Jamal Al-Harith, who blew himself up and it's alleged had received a million pounds when he left Guantanamo Bay. We only have four or five minutes, sir. Swift answers. Isabel Oakshot, is uh, it ever right to compensate I terror suspects? I think it's suspects? absolutely deplorable that he should have got that money, but even more deplorable that the government should somehow have lost track of this person. He was a former Guantanamo Bay detainee. How is it that we let this guy leave the country and head off to fight for jihad? Okay. <laughs> Douglas Carswell. I, 
I think what's truly shocking about this case is that we're not more shocked. We're so used to the idea of the British state being so hidebound by, by human rights lawyers and, 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 and compliance that there's little room for, for common sense. Um, we need, I think, to make certain that in cases, the cases such as uh, soldiers being uh, accused of wrongdoing in Iraq um, and cases like this, we need to make absolutely certain that we're not using legal aid. Uh, a million pounds compensation for someone in this case, it's outrageous. Peter Coates. He was detained. He was, he, 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 he was detained uh, unlawfully. He was detained unlawfully. Uh, and he was found... That, uh, he, he was possibly tortured, I don't know. Guantanamo Bay is a pretty awful place. And they, they put this man in. Uh, they had no evidence, and they, produced, no, they never did produce any evidence. And our, the British government, quite correctly, got him released. Uh, why it was paid compensation, I don't know. It might have been ash money. It could have been ash money. He, the, because the British government was complicit in Guantanamo Bay. And so I don't know all the story. It, on the face of it, it seems terrible. And ISIS is an absolute uh, an abomination. And we all want to see the end of it. But this individual, uh, and where, where it went wrong, I don't... I, how, how the security services lost track of him. I mean, that would be my big uh, uh, question. But Just, I suppose these things are much more complicated and difficult than we think. Justine Greening? Well, I think in the end, um, it depends on whether somebody's innocent or not. Uh, as, as Peter says, if they've been incarcerated for no reason whatsoever, that's one thing. If, if they've been incarcerated because in the end it, it's proven that they're a criminal, that's something totally different. I think when people were finally released from... Guantanamo. Clearly, um, as a government, people wanted to look at what the right form of settlement was for people who'd been held there effectively, unlawfully. I don't know in the end, I don't think nobody really knows what compensation this particular man was either paid or not paid as part of that. Why, why don't we know? Why shouldn't we know? Partly because um, there's a confidentiality around it in relation to the intelligence services and, and we need to respect that. Lord Carlyle, who's in charge of terror legislation before, said absolutely no merit in paying him a penny because plainly he was a terrorist. Quite. Do you agree with that, Andrew? Well, I agree with the comments that Isabel made earlier that people will be upset and angered that somebody um, was given a, what considered to be a huge payout and then um, went off and was able to go abroad and commit terrorism um, abroad. And I think that there's some unanswered questions by that. But we've got to be absolutely clear that some of the issues around that, as Peter said, were people being unlawfully detained without charge and potentially potentially subject to torture. We can't do that. And in fact, if we do do things like that, then we actually do radicalise people rather and it's counterproductive. So we've got to make sure that we uphold okay. British laws. You, sir. One brief comment. <laughs> brief comment. My son was tortured by the NHS. Sorry, no, I, I, I wanted the man... No, I, I wanted the man up there in the second row from the back. Yep. Let's hear you, please. Um, it makes me absolutely sick to my stomach that British government releases terrorists, yet members of the armed forces okay. and veterans are hounded on a state-sponsored witch hunt. Yep. It makes me absolutely sick to my All stomach. Right. All right, thank you. <laughs> and um, just before we end, just before we end, Robert Moss, let's just hear your question. Nobody's going to be allowed to answer it, but let's just hear it. It's a nice question. Who ate all the pies? Has football lost its sense of humour? <laughs> Thank you very much. It seems as though our time is up. We're going to be in Bedford next week. We have the Justice Secretary, Liz Truss, and the guitarist from Bombay Bicycle Club, who campaigns to involve young people in politics, on our panel. The week after that, we're going to be in Sunderland, so to come and take part in our audience, Bedford or Sunderland, go to our website, the address is there, call 0330123998. Five Live, of course, carries on the debate on question time, extra time. But my great thanks to our panel here and to all of you who came to Stoke-on-Trent tonight, where the by-election result will actually be announced in the early hours of the morning, as will Copeland. So I hope if you're interested in that, you'll stay up for that. From all of us here, however, until next Thursday, good night. I've been getting away with it.